Allora, io credo che si possa cominciare. Comincio con la richiesta di, di, di scuse, perché stamani eh, sarei voluto venire a sentire l'interessantissimo workshop di traduzione sulle poesie di Rachel, eh? Eh, ma eh, avevo un impegno eh, accademico noi, noiosissimo, peraltro, le, le, le telematiche insomma, di, di un concorso, quindi mi hanno impedito fino all'una di essere qui. Mm, però ora voglio un po' rimediare, quindi salutare eh, Rachel eh, Blaud Plessis per, la sua, per averci onorato della sua presenza, per onorarci e per insegnarci tante cose. Ecco, eh, tutti noi conosciamo l'importanza della, della sua poesia eh, e del suo impegno intellettuale, artistico negli Stati Uniti e in tutto il mondo, quindi siamo davvero onorati ecco, di averla qui. Eh, colgo l'occasione, eh, se Rachel mi permette un minuto soltanto, per salutare appunto questo secondo inizio d'anno, eh, secondo semestre di Semper, che vede per questo autunno Uh, quattro grossi appuntamenti, forse il più impegnativo è davvero quello di oggi perché è doppio, perché il personaggio è davvero cospicuo e anche soprattutto poi perché è articolato eh, in questo modo che quest'anno ha un po' improntato tutta l'attività di sempre, cioè questi workshop di traduzione letteraria, poetica soprattutto, e che eh, hanno portato, mi confermano quelli che hanno partecipato stamani, che è stato molto proficuo e positivo e che porta appunto grandissimi spunti di riflessione ma anche poi come dire, linee eh, di indagine eh, critica su quello che è ormai eh, la traduzione come un punto centrale degli studi critici, letterari, culturali eccetera. Avremo poi il 6 ottobre eh, un una conferenza, eh, anzi più che una conferenza, un seminario tenuto da due eh, studiosi di, di studi classici, insomma di lettere classiche, che eh, presenteranno una conferenza intitolata Un compito infinito, naturalmente questo è già nel programma, però volevo aggiungere qualche parola, sono mh, Federico Condello e Andrea Rodighiero che portano avanti ancora una volta eh, il tema della traduzione perché studiano come poeti italiani ehm, hanno tradotto eh, poeti e classici greci e latini e questo naturalmente pone ecco, tutta una serie di problematiche con le quali noi naturalmente ci relazioniamo anche noi traduttori di poesia moderna e contemporanea no? e quindi il confronto sarà eh, piuttosto eh, interessante dico per i trentini che questo incontro Ahimè, ahimè, ma naturalmente era tutto studiato e voluto, eh, si svolge a Rovereto perché sono state coinvolte, sono state coinvolte quattro classi di licei e quindi ci sarà un'ampia partecipazione di studenti, non solo universitari. Poi il 24 ottobre abbiamo l'incontro con la poeta Mariella De Santis e un suo traduttore critico, e, per finire poi il 21 novembre con uh, una uh, conferenza, uh, un seminario, diciamo sempre sono seminari nostri, uh, di Domenico Scarpa, uh, che è passato anche come dottorando da queste aule un, un po' di anni fa, uh, che uh, presenterà poesie con numeri e, dati, in, in, e date, in realtà presenterà la poesia di uh, Primo Levi eh, che mi piace sottolinearlo qui è come dire ha una, una delle, delle del, degli echi eh, insomma con uh, alcuni aspetti della poesia di Rachel eh, per, uh, un, appunto per essere una poesia di idee per essere una poesia impegnata anche eticamente politicamente culturalmente quindi mi pare che in, ancora una volta ehm, all'interno di Semper, proprio grazie a questi nostri stupendi ospiti che, che, che riusciamo ad avere, con la collaborazione di tutti, eh, qui parlo a nome anche del direttivo del consiglio ecco, scientifico di Semper, ecco, riusciamo a, a portare a termine. Quindi eh, cioè il principio è che tu se tiento, ma non c'è niente che nella letteratura, nella cultura escluda no? qualche altro aspetto o si ponga in, eh, in imicizia con quello, perché c'è sempre una dialettica, la cultura è questo soprattutto. Quindi ora non tolgo più altro tempo 
a Rachel uh, e forse non so se mh, Giovanna che è responsabile di questo incontro anche con il centro appunto di studi di genere eh, la ringrazio perché lei ha sempre portato uh, una voce uh, che entra in dialettica con la nostra tendenza di poveri <ride> accademici a fare a studiare poesia lirica e nella, in un ambito molto tradizionale, eh, però insomma direi che grazie al, con, al contributo di tutti ci siamo aperti molto a un'idea davvero molto più complessa, molto più vasta di poesia. Quindi ora cedo la parola a Giovanna, se ne ha bisogno, immagino di sì, e poi naturalmente subito a Rachel. Grazie, grazie, grazie Pietro, grazie sempre per uh, averci dato l'onore di aprire il semestre anche di sempre con questa giornata già incominciata mi sto guardando intorno alcune persone nuove ci sono quindi se mi permettete ripresento un po' brevemente eh, la nostra ospite anche per fare così lentamente la transizione nell'altra lingua e farla sentire non completamente straniera eh, stamattina we, we began this morning uh, uh, with the translations uh, and it was good it to was begin good. not at the beginning right because that, that's exactly what you do and I do want to thank my colleague Andrea Binelli for conducting a wonderful translation workshop this morning that was enriching uh, for us all now the word uh, is to Rachel Blau Duplessis i think she's going to take us into the realm of the more or less impossible question because it is so large that it dwarfs us all. Uh, you know, how to say the multiplicity of the world without breaking the rules of established poetry? How not to be disobedient if you want to account for the world in which we live? And by extension, you know, and more crucially, I think, uh, how to uh, address poetic genres, uh, ask ourselves how adequate they are when we want to talk about the everyday, when we want to talk not about life uh, with a capital L, but about lived lives, uh, which, needless to say, are always gendered, are always uh, the encounter of differences. Her poetry does exactly that, in my understanding. It redefines writing altogether. Um, and by redefining writing, uh, it allows us to give uh, a sense uh, of our being in the world, or being immersed. Uh, in the world. And that's why the collaboration with our Centro di Studi Interdisciplinari di Genere is mandatory. It's not, it's not a choice. It is there. It's right in the middle of our reflection upon poetics. Because this is poetics that wants to make a difference because it engages differences. And it is uh, right, uh, right there. So, i wish to thank uh, Barbara Poggio for being with us uh, um, and for collaborating to this adventure. I don't know if you want to say anything or is being thanked uh, enough? Uh, okay, thank you very much for this collaboration. It means a lot to, to many of us. Um, Rachel Brau Duplessis, very briefly, is Professor Emerita at Temple University. She is known uh, as a poet, of course, uh, as an essayist uh, as well, as a scholar, as a critic, uh, with uh, a particular attention to genre and gender, to gender and poetics. Uh, how do we put the two together? And she is uh, here to speak with us uh, this afternoon, and particularly important uh, in the panorama of US poetry as the author of the long poem, the long poem in the contemporary scene. She has written one poem entitled Drafts, of course it's a plural, uh, from 1986 uh, 
until 2012. It takes a long time to write a long poem, right? And it is, of course, it results in multiple volumes, uh, 26 years uh, to write this poem. And of course, she didn't stop after that, uh, because we do have uh, the post-drafts uh, poems uh, that uh, have been produced since 2014. I'd like to mention Interstices uh, and the graphic novella. And please have a look at the very, very recent uh, one that is standing in front of me. And also this double volume of Italian translations. Uh, the author is here with us, Annie Ballardini, we thank her, um, that collects uh, also some more recent poems. Uh, as I said, she's also an essayist, a critic, a scholar. Um, I want to mention her recent uh, Purple Passages because uh, it refers to the poems that are kind of in the background and have been revised by her poetics. Uh, uh, the poets that are right there in the middle of the 20th century. I'm thinking about Zukowski, Olson, Creeley, Eliot, Pound, actually Eliot Pound come before. Apologies for that. Uh, um, and it is part uh, of her feminist work as a critic uh, that includes also blue studios, uh, genders, races, and religious cultures in modern American poetry, and the earlier writing, uh, writing beyond the ending, uh, um, and obviously she's very well known for her uh, pioneering work on HD, uh, which is a milestone in criticism on HD. Um, I want to conclude, but I cannot do so without mentioning her work uh, uh, in the, her editorial engagement. Uh, um, the journals are too many to mention them all. One of the most important uh, is the leading journal of modern literature, but there is uh, uh, a very important contribution to feminist studies uh, that uh, is another unavoidable milestone in the debate about differences and how to deal with differences uh, in our contemporary. So thank you again for being here. You even have a podium by now, <laughs> thanks uh, to <laughs> Andrea. Andrea. And we're all looking we're, forward we're to your lecture. Right. This is sort of great. I love that bricolage passed to institutionalization very fast between, and of course I didn't really want my, my lecture to be placed on the trash bin so fast, <laughs> right? But okay, I'd like to thank all the people and units that brought me here. Um, semper poesia, and I agree, semper poesia. <laughs> Excellent idea. The Dipartimento di Lettere e Filosofia, Women's Studies, uh, the Translation Center um, of Andrea Binelli, and then mostly Giovanna Covi, but also the person whose translation is today's occasion, um, Annie Bellardini, with the book that we, w we worked on together that just came out today. This morning, it was our publication <laughs> moment. And along with the person who's not here, but who was here this morning, who also translated part of draft, Renata Moresi, um, in, uh, and her book being available also from Vaidia Edizione. Okay. I hope this doesn't go too fast, but here we go. The long poem, this is a biography and autobiography of a contemporary practice, which is more than a US practice. I will be mentioning Anglophone uh, contributions here and there, uh, because to me, Anglophone literature is one interesting thing with different um, uh, channels or areas. It's not English versus American, American versus Canadian and so on. So uh, that is my attitude and that's where I'm going to go. We live in the hegemony of the lyric poem, which has already been alluded to, where the shorter poem as a private or individual zone has become the benchmark or definition of poetry in general. This makes of the long poem a sprawling, influential, but often under-read area of literature, apparently always in the past. It's true that people through the ages have written long poems, not prose at first. It didn't really exist, I hope. 
them right, um, that is to, things to teach, to entertain, to articulate values, to show findings, to speculate, to philosophize, to study nature, and so on. There were Virgil and Homer for the epic, philosophical or cosmological meditation, Dante and Milton, tales or fables, Chaucer, scientific treatises, Lucretius, quest poems and courtly poems, the Roman de la Rose, and I hope I'm not wrong in mentioning Orlando Furioso. Okay, good. Bildungsgedicht, like Wordsworth's The Prelude, narrative poems like Barrett Browning. Neither one genre, as you can see, nor one practice. Still, its length gives a long poem undeniable cultural authority, or conversely, with boring long poems, vain attempts at such authority. I want to make some observations about modern and contemporary uh, Anglophone long poems, though thoughts both scholarly and experiential, personal, about the excessive project. I will talk a lot in taxonomical terms. Uh, these are useful fictions or categories or baseline postulates about certain works. The paper will have two contradictory impulses, wallowing in the long poem and schematizing it. Walter Benjamin's terms, term constellation and Charles Olson's word field, similar talismanic intellectual and poetic structures will summarize my basic intellectual structure of this paper, which should be kind of a field um, at the end. There are two kinds of long poems. Uh, this is already overgeneralized, but you will go, go with it. One kind is a one book poem generally a shorter book, uh, like those, con generally concluding, taking only months or years to complete, relatively contained, if also thematically rich. There are many of these books. It is a very personable mode in US and North American poetry at the moment, from Lynn Higginian's My Life to Harriet Mullen's Muse and Drudge, and so on, and it's often taught. The second kind of long poem takes decades to write, has multiple book or multiple canto construction, definitely overpassing one book, possibly never ending on principle, and is often visibly excessive, a life's work, even if you're not dead yet by doing one. Uh, debatable. Um, Williams, Pound, and Olson come to mind. There are a, num are a number of these very long works in contemporary North American poetry. A few might be Nathaniel Mackey's Song of the Andambulu, Ron Silliman's The Alphabet, and My Drafts. These uncontainable works are more my focus here without trying to scant the others. Various critics have commented. Peter Middleton calls these two types the long poem and the very long poem. The terminology is going to be very funny here. VLP. Ron Silliman calls these the long poem and the long poem, one word. Okay. Nigel Alderman calls the short ones pocket epics, which has a nice little crisp sound, and the long ones grandiose projects. You can see where his heart is. The valorization of the VLP with VIP, very important person, encrypted holds for the first two poet critics. The third really prefers the containable, as do most teachers. I'm going to focus on the absolutely excessive and uncontrollable long poem, the ones that don't want to seem to, don't want to end or don't want to seem to end in any way. It is, however, observable, especially in the contemporary period, that people writing VLPs like Ann Waldman, Bernadette Mayer, John Ashbery, Ron Sillabun, myself, perhaps Nate Mackey, often write and have written standalone, particular longish book projects, which for some are claimed as part of the whole thing, like long poems, very long poems, it's all one thing. The boundary between the VLP and the book length long poem is capricious, arbitrary, and willful. How long is long is a very funny debate that I cannot broach further here. It is almost a comic debate, but a very big one. One thing we can say is that the long poem is a mode of resistance, as um, Giovanna was uh, hinting, to the lyricization of poetry, the historical process of lyric reading that narrows the range of and knowledge of poetic genres only to the lyric. This is sort of Virginia Jackson's point. 
Um, if there are lyric elements or sections in long poems, one might say that the long poem engorges and transposes the lyric, reducing the lyric's impact to one genre among other modes. It's also true that this is another gigantic topic, that the lyric as such is often monologic, constitutively. It does not have other subjectivities or other voices in it, other characters. Um, that's, other characters don't speak. That's why the silent woman in the lyric is so, is so uh, is such an important topos. That's why a ballad is not a lyric. Just another little point there. In contrast, in the long poems, often other characters, other voices, other subjectivities, other discourses speak a lot. You could say that long poems incorporate the private or lyric sensibility into a much enlarged public site. A second thing to say is that long poems are often places where poets talk of putting in everything, as if the world could be contained or centered in this particular text. This is always inaccurate and very grandiose, sort of like Nigel Alderman suggested. But this comment in Poetics of everything emphatically announces high epistemological and ethical stakes for long poem ambitions. A third idea related to the everything is that these excessive long poems work as sumai or encyclopedic books of the culture. Sometimes such works are imperial, claiming to be substitutes for the rest of your library, a condensation of the important text, Ezra Pound's idea of a sacred anthology. And they themselves, they themselves necessitate glosses, glossaries, and reference texts. By the way, my, um, my interest in Pound is not an endorsement of his politics. Sometimes long poems call forth an actual academic institutional poetic culture, we call it the Joyce industry, the Pound industry, um, of study devoted to that work. Um, and Olson, Zukowski, and Eliot, as well as um, Pound and Joyce, have been so treated. Simply to read it, a literary critic has to become the committed ethnographer of each long poem culture, almost a cheering section. So to acknowledge very long poems mean to become tomes of engagement and intransigence. The didactic or public goals are not an unintended consequence. Because of this extreme excess, a long poem can feel imperious to the reader, trying to claim too much, intervene in too many fields at once, remake too many cultural compacts, and claim your allegiance too forcefully. This encyclopedism of the long poem is a pretty fascinating mimicry, both of the imperial thrust of world history during this time and of the simultaneous or approximately simultaneous loss of authority of one of the most gloss laden books in Western culture, some version of the Bible. Thank you, I didn't deserve that yet. <laughs> Not yet. But often, I like the point, you know, right around the Bible, we get the applause, right? <laughs> Applausy. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but more benignly, encyclopedism bespeaks the intellectual cultural thrust in modernity towards syncretism. These stances give rise to contradictions. A one person made sacred book, as Pound claimed, substituting for a desacralized book the Bible, and an imperial decontextualized set of references and allusions to many cultures, as one knows, for example, in the wasteland. I see somebody was Lauria, right? Appropriating mythical, historical, and cultural materials in a, an imperial fashion. Right. Um, <laughs> It's okay, I, I mean, it's okay, except it's, you know, it, it betraying my narcissism. What else? Anybody's? One, one, one second, okay, I don't wanna. In some cases of this, um, there's these contradictions. Cultural equality and cosmopolitan awareness are a result. In other cases, there's a synthetic and suspect grab of other cultures, cultures goods. In, a f in fact, a number of modern long poems are, are attempts at post-national synthesis, often as Matt Hart proposes with a mix of cosmopolitan 
and vernacular dictions, whether these borrow and remix from a variety of cultures, as does Zukovsky's A, the wasteland, like at the end, well, everybody with the wasteland goes, oh my God, um, these languages, um, and so on. The cantos, uh, Melvin Tolson's Harlem Gallery and his libretto for Liberia. Mackey's Song of the Andambulu, Waldman's Jovis, or in other, use, other discursive uses, um, s modern scientific engineering research sociological documents in recombination strategies such as you see in Tony Lopez in England and Alan Fisher and among others. Reports and jargons from global institutions such as multinational corporations being remastered in, in uh, basically by citation, often, especially Tony uh, Lopez's work, it's a kind of conceptual work. Some long poems try to investigate universalisms by assembling and channeling their totalizing claim and end by being both imperialist, <coughs> sorry, imperial and post-nationalist. It's a contradiction. There's another set of topics of long poems that investigate one sociocultural compact, a place often, one ge one's geographical space. Olson, uh, Charles Olson, William Carlos Williams, Camus Brathwaite, Hugh McDermott, John Kinsella, um, ba Basil Bunting, often having a synthesizing attitude toward that place. Williams' trope, the local is universal, is more than just a corny motto from American poetry. Once you add length and scale, the local synthesis and the universalizing synthesis start approaching each other. This sort of Gesamtkunstwerkness of, or everything poem parallels the growth and flourishing of grand theory in other fields, anthropology, science, and so on, claiming that a unified field will explain everything. These poems, of this sort seem to move into hypertext documents, splaying knowledge by multiple associations and information, even before the internet. There's most of these um, poems were obviously written before 19, I don't know, 70 something, when the internet, when we understand what hypertext means with all the links going off in all directions. These poems sort of do that before, avant la lettre, okay? And they also seem to be cinematic at the, at the time that cinema was first happening. The collaged jump cuts and swoops or swoons and tracking shots of film are such that you could almost imagine some long poems as cinemat cinematic. Um, however, people attempting the long poem now are writing after the collapse of unified totalizing theories and their modernist literary avatars, often myth. It's an interesting situation to be creating a monumental work while resisting both the apparent be benefits and the problematics of monumentality, as well as the illusions of totality. Because you, know, you can say you're doing something encyclopedic, but you know you're lying at the same time. The contemporary long poem teeters on a cusp between totalizing ideals and collage juxtapositions. A final introductory point, no, no generalization about these poems will be adequate in all cases. This makes the object of my study here, my selection, don't forget that, of modern and contemporary poems split, dissolve, and then coagulate again, differently aligned under various genre rubrics. Perha finally, the G generic modal and taxonomic mobility of these works among categories is uncorrectable. This is the dynamic territory of the long poem, never reducible to one explanation. So to anybody who wants to ask me after I do the middle of this paper, why did you put this work in this category rather than this work in that category? There's only one correct answer. You're totally right. So what kind of typology do you want? You can have something Aristotelian, historical genres and bibliographic families of long poems based on their closeness to very traditional genres, the three, lyric, epic, and drama. Some poets, some long poem poets, it goes without saying now, extend the lyric, whatever that may be, as I already undercut, um, into serial structures, Robert Creeley, Langston Hughes, George Oppen, Nate Mackey, B.P. Nickel, Robin Blazer, Harriet Mullen. 
There are works that start with the epic poem hovering in the background and perhaps taking a little detour through the prelude come out as Gwendolyn Brooks' The Aeneid, David Jones' The Anathemata, John Ashbery flowchart, Lisa Robertson, Debbie, an epic, uh, the conjuncture of Debbie and an epic is the irresistible, Bernadette Mayer, Midwinter Day. Then there are poems closer to drama or to performance. Here I would place the performance and drama of the long poem itself in its cantata-like qualities. Um, if a pound cantos could be sung as a cantata, if you had the patience. Um, for example, the cinemascope poem he said a play called The Dynasts by Thomas Hardy, 1908, that I am convinced is the first long poem in modernity. The Europe of Trusts by Susan Howe and Nameless, the visual verbal installation art or Gesamtkunstwerk of the unfortunately dead now New Zealand poet Lee Davis and the faux scholarly textual performances of Armand Schwerner's The Tablets, not to speak of the great work by James Merrill, the operatic The Changing Light at Sandover. Yet tonally and functionally and even formally, the works grouped under such genres are generally so disparate, disparate that, the, that it appears the Aristotelian one is a useless taxonomy. Or you could have a typology based on function. What's the summary functional goal of any long, particular long poem? As if poems could be said to accomplish or boil down to one single master function, which is nuts. But let's go with that for a second. These three modes, in my opinion, are the cosmolo cosmological, the historical diagnostic, and the psychosocial. You notice that I already, in two of those modes, I've already pasted together a couple of other genres. So uh, you can see where this is going. These three modes are based on a very general sense of, of function or purpose for each specific poem, and they risk overgeneralizing by extractive readings. Extractive readings meaning you just sort of, you go in there like a, and you slip up one idea out of this poem and you claim it's the whole thing. It's very familiar in literary criticism, but never mind about that. The, the work in each cluster that I've just named could be better viewed as a nexus, an ongoing unroll, unrolling set of responses within a certain named function. Talking here about some projects um, that I've named, but could certainly be extended. The cosmological long poem, beginning in our shared culture with Dante's Commedia, might seem to be obsolete in modernity, right? But surprise, it's not. The following Anglophone works are visibly and conceptually connected to it, if not to each other necessarily, or necessarily to piety. HD's double-sided coin rewriting two basic Western myths in Trilogy and Helen in Egypt, T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, John Ashbery's Three Poems, Louis Zukowski's Eighty Flowers. Then there are some quite different contemporaries, James Merrill's already mentioned Dantesque, The Changing Light at Sandover, the almost bluntly titled work, Divine Comedy, Journey Through a Regional Geography by John Kinsella, and Bruce Andrews' Lip Service, all make distinctive and saturating uses of Dante. An exemplary psychosocial long poem is The Wasteland. There is a side discussion available of why this is honorifically long when it's actually really, really short, um, as we know, about 430 lines. I'll skip that. There are any number of, of long poem discussions of the wasteland as a benchmark work, many proposing resistance to and critique of its findings. William Carlos Williams did this several times, at least in Spring and All, with direct allusions and rewritings, and in Patterson. Hart Crane's The Bridge was a direct response, uh, a more optimistic version of things, and so too were Zukowski's poem beginning The and Olson's The Kingfishers. Pound's Cantos only briefly acknowledged that work, but it was a defining factor for him, for the Cantos. Hope Muirlis's 1919 Paris prefigured it, quote unquote, and there are a few contemporary takes on the wasteland too, which I won't mention. The historical diagnostic long poem could not have been written without the examples of Whitman and maybe Browning and so on. Olson is central to this type now, although the documentary long poem like Muriel Rukeyser's US One 
an attempt to rewrite an echt epic or griot told heroic struggle, struggle cum wound, like Derek Walcott's Omeros, um, are related encounters with history and rectification. Also Camus Brathwaite, um, uh, his work, which I'm, whose name I'm losing slightly here. The poem including history, whatever the word include might mean, and this is Pound's ABC of reading, is probably one amalgam from a critic's point of view, but it has distinct political and cultural traditions that need particularized, particularized tracing. For example, in Hugh McDermott, who's like this but different. There's a pedagogic aspect to long poems in this epic strand. Melvin, Melvin Tolson insists that we need to, re to face the histories of the continent, meaning Africa. One might look for other nodules and claims in the long poem literature as ways of understanding the specificity of functions and traditions and goals for poets who have chosen the really long for their explorations. So uh, faced with the failure of these categories as I construct them, which is sort of the point here, um, I, like, um, I like that idea. These taxonomies are clearly inadequate. So are there no more effective categories for the, this formal and emotional quality of, um, the formal and emotional qualities of this object of study? Okay. In, so I tried for a while to go with a new genre I identification of line of thinking of this, uh, borrowing and extending the work of Smaro, Smaro Camborelli on the Canadian long poem, as it happens, but her taxonomy is very exportable. His, her work is called On the Edge of Genre, and that becomes very important. So I have a taxonomy a little longer than hers, based on an empirical um, and Aristotelian mode going back to genre and enlarging what is given by Aristotle and modifying it to some degree, more than the three functions. So I'm going to go very briskly through that. Um, first is narrative, musical, mythic works. Second is hyperspace, encyclopedic epics. Third is works of seriality. Fourth is odic logbooks of continuance. Fifth is new realist procedurals. Sixth is long poem as essay or conceptual text. And then a seventh will sneak back in, narrative but with a twist. My disinterest, by the way, in purely narrative poetry, like long poem by Frost, for example, is based on an implicit argument not made so far that purely narrative poetry is not particularly unique to modernism, and I'm looking for something unique to modernism, nor are its tactics distinctive in modernism except perhaps colloquial language. Traces of narrative material, by the way, exist across all of these poems, so it doesn't really distinguish them. I'm drawing for my examples, mainly from the Pound Williams line of US modernism, and we'll have to accept that limitation for now. So narrative mu musical and mythical works like T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets are one paradigm. Many of these poems occur as a quest plot, often with a post-personal sensibility, erosion of personality, as Eliot would have it, telling a transformative story of hope against odds with myths of quest and con continuous spiritual growth and investigation motivating the speaker, the work very often has a cosmological interface. HD's works, in, these are gonna now redo the, t you know, the typology, I mean, I mentioned certain works and they're gonna now weave around in a different way. HD's works in Trilogy and Helen in Egypt, Alice Notley's The Descent of Alette, their, with their articulate quest plots and mythic pulse and explicit rejection of syntactic fragmentation by the way, all fit here, along with Mackey's Song of the Andabulu. It is possible to imagine this kind of poem as not happening narratively in external worlds, but as being meditated or thought in a big cultural brain. Many of these works um, in this mode consist of allegorical or talismanic 
moments freighted with meaning, but we don't easily know the meaning. So reading skills and listening skills, especially in HD and Mackie, are often thematized. That is, one often sees the characters actively working to interpret some sign given to them within the poem. In this mode, sometimes plot turns even occur via near magical phonemes that are mumbled or incanted. And the poet seems to be orally mesmerizing, as all of these poets are. That is, they're very um, incantatory. Some modern long poems emphatically appropriate, ethic, appropriate epic auras. We are all deeply familiar with the mode, as I've already mentioned, of hyperspace encyclopedic epics. These field compositions that have seemed to symbolize the North American long poem in the 20th century, from the wasteland to the cantos, from Patterson to Jovis, from Maximus to A, and the martyrology of B.P. Nickel, a Canadian poet, to Norbis Phillips' Zong, these are often hyperspace or field compositions because of the collage correlation, the sense that one moves off via links to vortices of material that are not forensically or propositionally argued, but juxtaposed with others to occasion oblique inferences of and often many other discourses. Resolutely social, often epic in size, but also alluding to epic metaphors like battles or historical struggles like enslavement in Zhang, highly accumulative, explicitly documentary, but also filled with loose ends like the cantos, the model work here. A transformed nationhood, even if imaginary, is often at issue for these works. An alternative library can become a figure for this group. These poems are heterodiscursive and heterogeneric, meaning multiple, multiple, all the way. Literally, anything can be found in most of them. Shifting voices, polyvocal and multilingual, analytic claims, often unfounded or unsupported, exorbitant intertextual citation from other poems, but also from treatises, scrapbooks, archives, and documents. Many paratextual apparatuses like notes, double narratives, and glosses. For example, in Zhang, um, imagined names from the dead Africans under the water are put, imaginary because there was no record, of course, are, are kind of um, running a running head, but a footer, as we c would say, at the bottom of the text. Uh, all of these things are uh, paratext, that is not the text, but like indice indexes, table of contents, all of that stuff. Often the poems point to paradigm-shattering critical interpretations of one cul one's culture or are imperial in one's culture or both. These poems seek accountability, analysis, critique, even transformation in the socio-historical and literary senses. The distinction between that mode and the next mode might be articulated by imagining Charles Olson as Herodotus, of a gargantuan eclecticism, a digestive lust for both allegorical and informative anecdote, and with analysis, ethnography, and myth promiscuously mixed. Then imagine George Oppen as Thucydides, austerely studying the stakes of action and its outcomes, given interests, existential choices, conflict, fate, and accident. For the third genre category are works of seriality, Oppen's of being numerous, Robert Creeley's pieces, Langston Hughes's montage of a dream deferred, and in earlier times, possibly the actual first serial poem in English, Mina Loy's Anglo Mongrels and the Rose, from 1928, I think, but I, it, it's quite early. Um, women did invent modernism, but that's another lecture. Surreality is a meditative form of radical skepticism and repositioning with a deep investment in tentative, heuristic, leaping, and self-modifying statements that imply self-modifying attitudes towards structures. One sees a very errant path from point to point, a set of vectors oblique to each other that offer a sense of argument made by large socio-emotional shifts of intuition and assessment. Such a poem is notably unstable, unresolved, with any part cap capable of propelling or initiating new argument. In this mode, subjectivity takes a self-quarreling, shifting position with a volatile and passionate investigative agency. Hughes's insistence on 
uh, insistence falls on break, riff, oblique commentary, tamped down social inference in montage of a dream deferred, and the cunning fact of deferral as form. He represents the social array via short rifts and an endlessly deferred, fulfil deferred fulfillment of racial justice. This manifests a striking use of surreality as ongoingness hitting up against a political static entrapment on, in a stalemate. Often this mode el eludes uh, s sort of stylistically to the gnomic, the epigrammatic, the fragment, the charm or the riddle, the battle, ballad or the blues. My next category are really very long poems that don't stop. Odic logbooks of continuous is the, or the fourth category are life poems in Ron Silliman's terms. That is, you can write one maybe in 25 years. You don't have to be dead to enjoy the fruits of a life poem. But without, generally, the mytho political claim of the epic, and often with their serial possibilities more diffuse, the border between serial poems and odic logbooks is hard to define, and perhaps the only difference that distinguishes these two is how soon closure comes. It's considerably loosened and lengthened for the potentially endless logbook, because you're keeping an endless log of your so-called life. Olson's Maximus, when the, by the time the third book's book emerges, in part edited by another person, one realizes the degree to which the whole work is arguably a logbook, even if he might have placed his work as a hyperspace epic or an archive. Why logbook? Just the sense of launching out on a journey in space-time with each stage of the poem an immense temp temporal engagement with continuance and retrospection in the ever-changing now. And why odic? Why evoke that mode of practice? Well, we mi one might see the desire to remix the two kinds of odes, the Horatian, urbane, temperate, witty, observational, and the Pindaric, out of control, ecstatic, evocative of the sublime. In both there is a calling out to vocation. Though it's possibly untoward for an author to place her own work, drafts fits well enough into this category. My next category, the fifth, is new realist procedurals. Here in this category, category would go chanting, T-J-A-N-T-I-N-G, and pretty much anything else by Silliman, by uh, Lynn Huginian's My Life, Kenneth Goldsmith's Soliloquy. And th um, these writers have all declared specific and inventive procedures of counting and measuring as plans for action for the works, making some commitment to putting the same world together, but differently. The procedural examples are notably all language poets or concept contemporary conceptual poets. This procedure can be as simple as something like making a fixed number of varied sentences per prose section or recording everything you say in a week, but interestingly for Kenny Goldsmith, the words of no other person. The obsessive writing with an often documentary goal reduces the expressive subjectivity and perhaps individual ego in favor of language acts. This mode is decidedly and um, pr clearly for the people a way of being free of literature by making writing. And actually writing is a very key word in American poetry, not just in this mode. It's often a mode in which one sees a debate about the subject I, sometimes appearing, sometimes dissolved in a, in a plethora of other discourses. I think it's time for another sip of water. Although many of these modes touch, there does need to be a separate category, the sixth, for the long poem, as, uh, like essay, as conceptual text. It's what Maller may happily called poem critique, a mix of poetry and theory, often coming, by the way, in prose. So prose can be a long poem, and often is um, in the contemporary world. Stein, Gertrude Stein, some of her poetic essays or oblique e essays, is a good enough parent here and remains a model only partly tapped. In the contemporary period, Robert Duncan's life work in poetics and in prose called the HD book, only somewhat about HD, should be in this category. Caroline Bergvall's brilliant Drift, a contemporary work, um, it's like a Gesamtkunstwerk uh, about 
the, the refugee crisis in the Mediterranean and is very worth everything. It could be placed here, but also worked by David Anton um, in his talk poems. Camus Brathwaite's essay poem, Books of Conceptual History, among others, um, a reading by Beverly Dolan. There are many, many works in this category. It's not so much that the works are often in prose, which is poetry lacking line breaks, but that they make commentary on and intervention into both poetry and poetics. In this, work, in this group of works, there's often a discursive explanatory impulse, an intervention in critical self-reflection. Finally, sneaking back in, stories, straight, mocked, or queered, updated epics with no quotation marks here, some graft in Romana Huck's words onto the epic, or for me, a transfusion from it. Here, Derek Walcott's Omeros, Kenneth Koch's Co, or A Season on Earth, Sharon Hubiago's Heart Country, and so on, are some of the possibility, so too, um, the uninnocent um, Gwendolyn Brooks's Annie Allen containing the Anneid. That is, she puts an epic inside a lyric. Uh, I mean, it's a very witty work, to say the least. This whole discussion, this bulk of my presentation, is so naggingly unsatisfying that its only use is pedagogic. That is, y these categories are very useful to teach it, but um, the borders and distinctions are useful only so that you know them. When my real claim, like Smorrow, Camborelli's runs counter to these borders, but needs them to establish the claim. The poems are constructed in genre crossing or extensive allusions to or eclectic eruptions of other modes precisely because modernity presents plethora and impurity and intertextuality, overload and interior exile without re regard for convention. Genre interpenetration, collage collision, including genre collage, the edge of genre, the traces of, of temp and temporalities of genre allusion and social meanings create a choreography of some intensity as readers are pulled by conflicting genre expectations and their socio-political feel in reading. Should we want any genre definition? Maybe what I've given here is a ghost taxonomy, but no final definitions. Um, and this is mimics the endless cultural acts of the long poem itself as creolized, inclusive, errant, omnivorous, palimpsestic, and overwritten always with more writing. Now we're going to pour some water. Always an act. And you wonder whether the speaker will spill all the water over the electronic equipment. This said, I will now pivot this paper to the autobiography of practice. This is a little bit, maybe a little um, reset for some of the people who are here this morning, as, as it happened by accident. My poems between 1986 and 2012, 26 years, make up one long work called Drafts, now at about 1,000 pages, sort of, more or less, and folded up, which is a way of saying, never completed, never finished, but closed at, at the last poem, at 114. Drafts exists both as an unmonumental monument and in autonomous canto-like sections as a large field into which a reader may enter anywhere and read in any order. Except for knowing, with a very great sense of being startled by it, that in 1986 I seemed to be inside the space of a long poem. Drafts were not premeditated. When I began, I had no sense of how long the poem would be, how, po how it possibly could be, or how many years it, it would take. I found out th all of this only in the course of doing the work. And the titles around which individual poems formed, which you now see in front of you, were not pre-thought when I began the project. They emerged, they emerged one by one. Uh, as, and in the process of writing, there was a turn at 19, down there, at the first blue line, as it, it just happened to be come out as blue for some reason, um, when I thought, well, how can, how can this poem go on 
Can it just be like, you know, those, like when girls do those string things with crochet and they make this long thing in, the, in a spool crochet and it comes out of this long string and then nobody knows what to do with it? You know, do you make a little rug or, you know, it's impossible. Okay. Uh, I had no idea, like, is it just going to make its long string forever and ever and ever or whatever? And so I thought, well, I'll start again. And that was a very key intuitive finding. So I thought, well, if I start again, I have to start by linking the poem, the, the first poem of the second row, so to speak, to the, the first poem of the first row and so on across. And it, beca it was very quick um, knowledge, but a very long uh, process of realization that actually this was a pretty good idea, strangely enough. Um, and I, had, I did this when there was, and I called this the fold so that actually you can imagine a, pleat a, a, thing, a series of pleats so that each of the lines folds over um, so you get sort of one little pleated thing at the end. Um, th this was a very strange idea, especially since I'd only written 19 of these poems when I began the 20th, was seven years into the project, which was 1993, I had only 20 works done. And I thought, well, how many of them are there going to be? And there was a kind of interaction um, around this with somebody whom I like very much, and we have very different memories of this. He, this is Bob Perlman. He said um, to me, he claims he said, there would be a hundred like Pounds Cantos. And I said that he said to me, um, this is the he said, she said of literary history, he said, how many of them are there going to be? And I sort of said, a hundred like Pounds Cantos. He's, a, he's sort of written on Pound. And he went, <gasps> and I went, <gasps> But so we have different memories of who actually said 100 like pounds cantos. But I thought, well, you know, you can't do pound again, um, and you can't really do 100 since he didn't really do it either. So I figured that what I would do is figure out a big number that was um, a, a number that was a multiple of 19. How many, how many things could you get with a multiple of 19? So I carefully, you know, cogitated on the multiplication table and came out with um, 114, which is six times 19 as it turns out, sort of a big number. At that point, as I said, I had like 94 more poems of that number to write. <laughs> it was like, who knew what was gonna happen? Uh, a diagram or grid of the finished work reveals that between, well actually this one doesn't reveal it because there's a little missing thing at the bottom, um, reveals, if it did, that between 2000 and 2003, I destabilized this number 114 by writing an unnumbered poem it's supposed to be there, sort of underneath. It's not numbered, and it's a summary of the prior 57 poems um, and becomes unnumbered, which would sort of be number 115 if you were counting up all the numbers. And I was very pleased with this decision, first of all, that the ending might, the summary, Precy, might come at the, in the middle. That seems like a very satisfying idea. And the second thing that was satisfying was that there, you'd never know how many poems there really were. Was it 114 or 115? So that seemed quite um, idiomatic. Th this proposes an instability around the question of the final that goes with the open-ended drafts as an idea. Closing was just a step on the way to opening it again. Well, and so all the poems, each of these poems is very finished aesthetically. That, that, I mean, that's a principle. They're not messy, sort of open that way, but they are open-ended epistemologically. So they're closed, so to speak, aesthetically and open epistemologically. The strategy of the unnumbered poem, the particular numerological play with the odd and even numbers, along with the important strategy of the fold, were all features discovered in the course of writing. I can't emphasize this enough. I could never in the world have written a poem of, that took me 26 years on a plan that I had conceptualized sometime in 1986. It would not be possible to do that. So drafts really is a work of continuing poesis or continuing making. The strange thing is that um, that it's very complicated for a reader to look at this scheme because it looks like it was so pre-thought and the reader has this sort of 
like the revolt of the reader, like, ugh, all these poems, all that's thrown at me at, at once. So I have to say that for me, it was a mis an open mystery at any time what was going to happen with this poem. So the reader's position of um, resistance, at, like, like to too much, the plethora, the excessive, and so on, and the writer's interest in like, oh my goodness, look at what's happening, are very, very different interests, a sort of poignancy about the long poem. The poem, the poem as a whole is a, like a territory or a country into which I went for a very long time. The tones are different, the genres are different, the feeling is different in many of the poems, although the fundamental basis is both midrash or gloss and the serial poem formally. Why do this at all? I will simply observe something that um, some other poets have confirmed. The interesting thing about writing a long poem like this is that it has a private temporality of doubling one's life. This motif of doubling in general began early in my work and it's this motif actually that I proposed to Annie Ballardini that, and that she followed in her translation. This doubling, not duplicity, n um, not, uh, but doubleness. Uh, so drafts is a little bit like painting oneself in a corner by design and then constructing more of the building so you can continue to paint it, if you know what I mean, if you've ever done that. Generally speaking, the poetics of the lifelong poem is making. Further, the more one has of the poem, the more it seems as if making that poem is your mission in life. And it seems as if from people I know like Mackie and Silliman and Waldman that you don't really begin without some intuition that this might actually be so. So making a long poem has a public and private temporality. Long poems are a passionate activity working inside time to respond to various personal and historical necessities via this responsiveness. So it's not just making a big thing like a big blob uh, you know, that comes along down the road, but it's making a response to the world as such. I'm going to stop there. Um, it, it's sort of approximately 45 minutes with a, a, maybe a page more to read, but I think it's time for you to be able to talk back if you would like. Or, or leave as you have to. Um, so, d so anybody want to say something? That's, that's a ten, uh, Please a course, an entire course on the long <laughs> poem. You know, it's like you know. I it's know. Really I mean, I nice. just, I kind of thought that. Yeah. Well, you know, if you wanted to hear about it, I'd try to tell you some things about it. And they're all, many of these statements are are very um, exploratory. You know, you could explore more. Like, why did she say that this or that? Um, that's not supposed to be a finished thing. Uh, did you have a question, or are you just waving your fingers? Okay. It's uh, that danger of waving one's fingers. Uh, it's very large. I would like to ask you to expand a little bit more on uh, this idea of doubling, of the double, no, doubling, and, uh, yeah. and this process, because what I'm curious is about uh, your creative process. Oh, okay, well, here's the, the thing about... Um, oh, here we have it, duplicity. I know, I know, uh, there's an, there's an, uh, right, that's why I say it's not duplicity. Duplicity. <laughs> there is always onomastics. We we were just at the Biennale, and there was a woman who did asymic books. So it's um, the asymic book is is like magic writing, which is not writing. It's yeah okay. And her name was Irma Blank. Blank. <laughs> Blank. So that was sort of there is an onomastics. I mean, there is always a dentist who's named you know Pain or something like that. P Right. Or, you know, I mean, I don't mean to make jokes at other expense, but yes, I, I have noticed that actually, uh, but it's not to deceive. This is to, uh, to double. My, okay, it actually, the introduction to Annie's book, to our book, um, it talks about one of the first moments of that. So in the po it was noticing that Emily Dickinson, as a poet, whom Giovanna mentioned uh, earlier, um, that Emily Dickinson 
sometimes, not all the time, uh, changed words, changed lines, and in one particular case, changed stanzas. That is, she wanted different words in the same page space. Well, in a poem, you're not supposed to have different words in the, p in the same space, if you understand what I mean. Like, that's, a, that's a textual problem. If you have a, you, to, to um, establish copy text or final text or bibliographic finality, you're supposed to have one word in that spot. Okay, well, Dickinson destabilized this iconicity of the, of, the po of the poem, in this case, the lyric poem, by wanting two words, possibly for two different people whom she was addressing or giving the poem to, for other reasons because they're, it, basically by doing this, she destabilized meaning, even the complicated meaning that she was, you know. So the idea of having simultaneous meanings in the same page space it was very interesting to me, and I started working uh, um, through that idea in various ways, uh, double column poems, um, and it just was an, was an interesting idea about page space, which is extremely important to contemporary poetry in general, certainly to contemporary American poetry. And um, so, so that was, that's one thing about doubleness. Um, the, the fact is that one of the poems that Annie translated, which is Hinge, sort of starts the same way, and it has double sections, and then it sort of hinges open, and it starts again, same basic idea, in a different, and it says slightly different things. So it's a question of, of putting difference and sameness together in the same page space also. There are many things that could be said about that. There is possibly a, a gender component in the sense that, um, you know, the iconicity of the female, but the silence of the female in lyric poetry is a gigantic problem for the female poet. This is a cultural habit of mind. It's not about actual female poets who go you know, like any uh, poet, go blabbing on as men poet, male poets do. But th the fact that you're supposed to not be speaking, and that's the problematic of the lyric for me, which is that it's not just a general person not being able to speak, but it is in poems by Dunn. You can see it. You can see the place where he reaches out to the female figure, usually, s you know, literally in bed, and says something, and she can't talk back. She is not allowed by the nature of poetry to s actually speak in the poem. And this is of intense interest to me. It's why you see a very interesting struggle, for example, between the ballad and the lyric in Wordsworth's very important poem for me, Resolution and Independence, where he goes blabbing on about this, you know, how miserable he is and he's walking in the landscape, blah, 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 and of course it's gorgeous and everything. And then he discovers there's this guy, you know, this old guy who's really like, um, he's a leech gatherer, which means he's among the poorest of the poor, and the leech gatherer speaks in the poem. He has very few words, but he does get allowed to speak by Wordsworth. Remember, this situation is the poet is constructing this poem. It shows the trace of the ballad in this lyric poem. And then Wordsworth, you know, after assimilating the lesson of the leech gatherer, which is, I survive, it's okay, you can survive too, I look for the leeches, there aren't that many of them, but we were trying hard, you know, to find them. Leech get, leeches were for medicine, you know, at that time. Um, and, you know, then he goes, oh my goodness, I'm so stunned by this insight that one has to survive. And, you know, to me it's like, you have to let the other speak in your poem. <laughs> look, that, look, that's what you just did. You let this other give you advice. And, you know, of course it's a constructed situation. So it's that the other gets to speak in a poem is part of the page space poetry of many, many people, including Eliot, you know, including Pound, who do have, uh, you know, one or two problems about gender. But once you let the other speak, that, you know, that then you, you've you opened the poem to other voices. And that's really, you know, like modern American poetry. Um, it, it's, it's quite a complicated situation with doubleness. So doubleness is in a way r responding to the iconicity, which is singularity, one thing. I just rest there. It's just, a, it reminds me of May Swenson's poetry, even this iconographic 
because uh, this again this duplicity this idea of having two speakers on the same line or slightly on a different line but parallel the thing is, there is a genre where other people get to speak. It's called drama, and it's also called the novel. I mean, there's n it's not like no male person ever let another person speak in the work. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying something about the nature of poetry as a discourse the, and, and as an institutionalized practice in punto. Anybody else have anything to say or to yell? <laughs> or anything, or, or anything. I have just a very concrete question, which is probably more a curiosity um, about location. Uh, I'm interested to know if I can where you were when you were writing this very long poem, I mean, 26 years, was it where you mainly located in the US? Because it seems to me that the references that you have, it's a whole word that is, uh, and it's a whole conversation that you have uh, with uh, modernist US writers. So I was wondering if uh, you had changed location. What would happen to that long poem? <laughs> okay. That's a, that's a very, um, it's, it's a, a very, very sweet, sort of sweet, crazy question. In many ways, my answer would be I'm in the world. I mean, I, of course, I have I have a social location. I have a gendered location. I have a um, linguistic location. I, um, I have a, a temporal location. I have a sort of religious location or spiritual location, and so and a political location, and uh, uh, you know, and uh, and so you know, so. and and I, what I did for a living, and you know, so on. Basically, the simple answer that is, where was I? I was either in my study in the suburbs in the US or in my study in the city in the US, uh, two different places that we lived, or on a train to work where I would correct the poems sometimes when I had, you know, doing a little work on the train, or in Umbria where we live in the summer for a couple of months. And so I was in Italy for part of this, and I, rem I have written some of these poems definitely in Italy, and I can see in certain imagery, for example, in, um, the in a poem that is a very pastoral poem, um, the problem is you sort of lose track, um, which is eclogue, actually, um, if I'm not mistaken, that poem was definitely written in Umbria. I mean, and the, the uh, having both a, an urban and a, and a sort of, um, you know, like country location is, has been important. I generally don't write when I'm traveling. I find it very difficult to actually, r aside from writing on the train, making a few corrections uh, to a poem. Uh, I don't, like, I'm not writing right now, but I also read the newspaper a lot and I read science, um, popularized science a lot, like the Science Times of the New York Times, as you know, and things like that. So scientific discoveries and uh, sort of world ecological crises are very important to me as to many poets. So I, sometimes I put the news in, in the poem, in, the, in Days and Works, I actually cite um, newspaper clippings which is a little bit like a poetics of, well, you're writing, but everything, something else is happening over there and something else is happening over there to give this sense of a plethora, a, a disorganized plethora in a way. And um, that, so, but uh, many sources come in, as Annie pointed out um, in the morning session, many different sources come in. I glean from lots of different things. I'll glean a word from someone, but I generally, unless I, can't track it anymore. I always generally annotate. I'm really a scholar in many ways. I will not let s my citation of a word go by without annotating. I actually like, in a bizarre way, the footnote practices that have dr that are so weird in poetry, another an unconventional thing. You're not supposed to have a footnote in a poem. That's the job of the Norton, you know, the Norton anthology that bores you with telling you what you already know and the obvious in this is our culture. But Eliot's Wasteland, which is so weird, 
but does have footnotes, sort of lies at the same time. Um, Moore's, Marion Moore's poems, um, Z Louis Zukowski's poems, Melvin Tolson's poems, those are modernists who use footnotes. They use them as paratexts, and I choose to do that also, although it is also a way of making your poems definitely not lyric poems, but it also weirds, as we say in America, it will weird some people out. <laughs> because it's like a poem has footnotes. I mean, it's the worst possible thing you could do is make a poem with footnotes. And I do it, not only do I do it like as a gloss at the end of the book, but I've actually written a poem that has footnotes built in, which was, I, um, oh my God, I'm now losing track. I think it's, um, well, never mind about that. We can find it someday, <laughs> right? I literally, you know, it's, Gone away a little bit. I don't know, um, there's also writing on writing, if you remember. There's oh, this yes. very long <laughs> poem, Writing. And then she has a section, Writing on Writing. So the title of the poem is Writing, uh, which is very long. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, it explains so much of, no. uh, well, that's the ideal for a translator. <laughs> right, right. So it's actually the. Th you can see sort of in points of interest as you go by. Um, but the, the, there's always a secret thing underneath. Um, yeah, put the thing that I like to point out, especially pedagogically, is that the genres, there are genres there that are really um, just running, running down. Um, if, you, if you run down, Haibun is probably the first thing you could call a genre. That's a Japanese genre where you put, um, you have, it's like um, basho, a, tr a, a long trip to backwoods. Um, it's a kind of wonderful travel writing, very odd. So it has a sort of travel writing component and then it has a haiku. And of course they're very vectored outward. Yeah, one doesn't explain the other. So haibun, um, conjunctions is kind of a grammatical thing. Um, and then going up, let's see, findings is kind of like, um, I think that's my first alphabet poem. There are a lot of alphabet poems in here. Intellectual autobiography. Now, there's a good one for the scholars among us because often when you apply for a grant, they say, what is your intellectual autobiography? And you immediately freeze <laughs> like a deer in headlights. Like, I have, oh my God, what I have none. I haven't thought a thought ever. You know, so intellectual autobiography, <laughs> right, is one. Um, Renga is another one which is linked haiku. Cento or cento, I've never known how to say that, is... Uh, supposedly quotations from the great epic, um, which is usually Virgil. So I just quote from my own poem. Um, predella, uh, you know what they are. They're the little pictures underneath the altarpiece. A predella and another predella and another predella. So I made these little th things. A Georgics is a term about work, obviously. W one lyric, epistle, Uh, songs, clay, clay songs, maybe the next one. Mid midrash, as a, uh, um, the gloss in Hebrew scripture, eklog. So y there's not, it's not like the genres are all in the same place. They're just sort of all scattered around randomly. Um, rebus, sort of, is a genre, rebus, but dialogue of self and soul. Now there's something you can really chew on because it's a Yeats title, right? So it's a dialogue. Um, Spirit ditties is often also, also sort of song-like. Sentences, lexicon is a sort of genre, but not one that you often find in poetry. Manifesto is a pun on manifesto, which is f amusing to me. I mean, the, it seems you have to amuse yourself, actually. Um, dog roll, now there's one. That's a very, very um, fierce feminist poem in rhyming couplets, actually. Uh, rec highly recommended in the in t contemporary American life. Um, buzz track is a genre, but it's an odd one. I mean, it's what you get like um, a static in in a recording, right? For that kind of thing. Envoi is one. Well, you can see the story here. So there are random genres, and there's kind of activities. One of my favorites, by the way, is. 
inter cross posting, ex posting, which is, I'm sorry I cross posted if this co message comes to you, you know, but it's also, I copied, one of the only times I've actually done this, I copied a poem by Inge Ingeborg Bachmann, the German poet. I just simply hauled off and rewrote her poem. I extended it. And then I in the next one is an interrogation. Like, you st in effect, you stole my poem. Not exactly by Bachmann to me, but sort of like, you, you know, bad, bad, bad. What did you do this for? And so there's a kind of matching poems. Proverbs is very funny actually, but it is, and they are proverbs. Romantic fragment poem. Those of you who are familiar with romantic poems know there's something called romantic fragments. Male art is the first break into visual text. Male art is a genre that was mostly in visual text. Um, people sent stuff to each other, and there's a whole practice of that in modernity. Um, rubrics, canzone, ah, canzone. Canzone is actually, um, really like supposed to be like Vita Nuova. It really truly is. And I highly recommend it to people who know Dante. It's, it's like a, t you know, in Vita Nuova, Dante does these amazing poems and then he puts his literary critic hat on and he tells you what to think. Well, in the first stanza here, I just did this and look, look how good it was. And then over here there was a turn and, and you go, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, why are you telling me? And it's so funny. The pedagogy of Dante doing this earnest, I mean, it's one of the first acts of literary criticism really in our culture, I would think. He, and it's, the fun, it's sort of the funniest thing to actually almost undermine your own poem by explaining it and over explaining it. So I kind of wanted to do the same thing. And so what happened with Canzone is it's this really er, very beautiful Canzone. And at the end of which you, know, you think, well, that was a great ending, why don't you stop? So then you have to go explain it. So I had to begin it again by the explanation and then end the poem again with its prose passage. It's actually very kind of wonderful and funny. Puppet opera is really, an, you know, of two people, two characters, two puppets talking to each other, a male and a female, another point for the Women's Studies program, which are very, with a male is um, a hand puppet he, work, he works, he thinks autonomously. The female poet is trussed up on the top. She's a, a marionette and she can't move. And they, d they dialogue about stuff, <laughs> um, you might imagine. And then <laughs> ballad and gloss, as I mentioned, that's kind of um, taking on not in the same way, but the rhyme of the ancient mariner. That is, it's using his strategy. There's a ballad and then there's a gloss. Um, and they sort of say different th things. Wall newspaper, primer, which is an alphabet poem, and index, uh, before the end. Index is just a list of words, some of which I use and some of which I don't use, of course, naturally. And um, I don't know, y what should we do? You want me to, I could show primer. Is there anybody have any patience? No. Well, well yeah, my from the back. Oh, okay. I would like you to. I would like to. You may think you can yell. No, because I'm slightly deaf. You really have to do do this. I I can't I can't cope. <laughs> um, um, I'd like to ask if uh, how you feel as a poet in the about the relationship between written and oral form. Uh, because personally, I only recently, I think, discovered the importance of oral form uh, and how far this is connected to poetry. And um, I mean, yeah, if how you feel, how you feel about that? That's a, that's a very large question. Basically, uh, I'm, a, I'm a poet who has, who works with written form. I, I publish my work. I don't, I, I don't extemporize. Uh, in public, except maybe like now, but not a poem. So I'm not a slam poet, I'm not a dub poet, I'm not doing that kind of work of sort of popular poetry that does that. I have a lot of respect for the people who do, including the capacity for rhyming of rap. Um, although it may be sort of nasty in content sometimes, but the, the, um, the, the ability to do that, you know, a kind of dog roll, a quote unquote, without the, uh, without the invidious, connotations of that word are very important in contemporary poetry. So, but poetry reading aloud is a practice that many, many people of 
in American poetry have practiced now for gen a, a number of generations. And so I do a lot of reading aloud in public and record with rec and there's a lot of recordings available of people like me but other poets, similar poets. On usually the best place is sort of either online or pen sound, which um, you know our, our um, friendly um, neighbor university from Temple, University of Pennsylvania, that has a very good poetics program, in, in, which has a t gigantic list of poets who've been recorded or archived with their recordings on Penn Sound. So Penn Sound dot something or other, but you'll find it. Well, I guess I just want to thank you for going through uh, the grid with us uh, because uh, it was a much more friendly communication. I felt that when you said, oh, now it's your turn to speak, everybody wanted to hide because you actually overwhelmed us <laughs> with the mapping of contemporary poetry, contemporary American poetry, which, you know, remember you're in another country. Right. Uh, the same way that your poetry overwhelms us, because yes, it is true, you know, you pick up drafts, uh, volume and volume of, poem, of poetry, and it is one poem, and where do I begin? How do I select it? Uh, it's like, you know, faced with Walt Whitman. I always go to the beginning. Yeah. Faced with Walt Whitman and having a semester. <laughs> How much do I slice off? <laughs> faced with Emily Dickinson's th thousands of poems and having one yeah. semester, which numbers do I choose? I, I, I right. It's that. a little bit of that. And sometimes you go like, OK, I just want a poet that gives me one title, one page, uh, so I can comfortably deal with that. Um, but I see a point, and I would like to sort of improvise a, a provocative, a t tentative interpretation to the purpose, you know? Words are maps. You've given up as maps, only pedagogical, of course, because you're irreverently free. <laughs> you can't be leashed, even within your freedom. <laughs> you know, we have 114 poems and one unnumbered poem in there. Let's remember that kind of disobedience, which is wonderful. Um, I'd like to understand uh, whether it is unavoidable for somebody who takes on the responsibility and wants to be accountable for the world we live in for today um, to embrace uh, this formless form. Uh, we always talk about the contemporary as displacement. And I would like to say that displacement is both negative and positive. Yes, the refugees are displaced, but there's also something positive in displacement, otherwise cultures don't get in contact with one another, otherwise we don't take ourselves outside of our own little turf and are even incapable of seeing ourselves, right? So there is this idea of uh, the destabilization of the words uh, in the line, the line which is that verse that makes as a verse a conversation but a conversation just simply because it turns. That's all there is in a verse. It's yeah. something that turns, turns around, twists, mm. uh, turns around and looks at the other. And it, it's very much uh, all there. And it captures, it seems to me, the continuous displacement that is overwhelming. When we open the internet, uh, it is overwhelming. We have to choose what to link with what. Um, am I oversimplifying? Yeah, I mean, I think, there's, first of all, I like very much the linking of the etymology of verse. That's really all of the conversation terms, uh, turns, verses, and so on. That I know that, that it's a very big project. And what I would say very simply 
is that you have to pick from your need and from your love or your intuition or your just curiosity. Like if you see a title of something, of course, neither Dickinson nor Whitman have titles, so it, well, it, compl it complicates things m a lot, or Whitman somewhat. But um, if you see a first line of Dickinson or a title here or something that you think you just would like to figure out, so look at it, and then if you don't like it, turn the page. It, it's really very simple in a way. The only way to read poetry, finally, to, to understand, to educate yourself in it, is, co is a little bit by love, uh, by searching for something that, that connects to, your, to you. Um, it's not something out there, particularly. I did this, to, in some sense, not, not ignorant of other people, <laughs> to say the least, but I didn't do it to please them. I just did it, and I suspect it's hard to know about Whitman for me, I, but Dickinson did it to please herself, and then if, uh, luckily, they were, the poems were saved. Uh, that's another story about female poetic production, but you can also think, I'm doing this for all the female poets who weren't saved, is another gender line of thought here. Um, I think plethora is something that we have to cope with with a sense of ethics. That is, you don't want to go to an internet site that is particularly ugly, um, actually, because it will really corrupt your, you know, your mind. That is, that is um, intellectually or ethically ugly. Uh, and then you want to try to understand the world possibly provoke somebody to change the world, including yourself, but you're not writing to polemicize, you're writing to understand what can go with what. And um, that's, you know, we could probably have a longer conversation about this, for sure, but, but that's some thoughts about what you're saying. I certainly agree with some of the terms you're using, like it implicitly here, contact zone, um, uh, exile as a condition, although there is, a, privileged exile, and there is unprivileged exile, and I think we can't forget um, that eventually there is a sort of hopefulness in the poems about um, transformation without transcendence, I guess we, we would have to say. Thanks so much. That's really putting it much more nicely. There's no poetics that is also political without ethics. Right that allows you to choose the politics of that poetics. Thanks a lot. There's a question over there. I was there. wondering about the, the, the very last word that it, in the title, uh, Volta, is that, is that a, a, turn, a turn and maybe a, be, a re -beginning? I don't know, how is this? The gather right. It's meant to be uh, the indication that that the project, this particular project, sorry, this particular project um, felt that it had come to a, a, a place to stop, not, you know, any more closed. And what was interesting to me is that then I launched myself into some other projects, but with it was high risk behavior, I could say, without being too um, self-praising. It, it led to a few years of kind of misery where I kept on thinking, Boo-hoo, Drafts was so such a good title. Why didn't I just continue? Poor me, whatever, you know. And then I thought of another title, Traces. And then I thought that, I thought I was working on that, but there was a further double turn. One was for things that seemed to be very quotidian, which Traces is, but that book represents in another book that I wrote strangely this summer called around the day in 80 wor wor worlds, sorry, I got um, hung up, which is a title taken from Cortazar, actually, via Jules Verne, right? Around the world in 80 days, everybody knows that. And Cortazar changed it, and I decided that I would simply take his title with acknowledgement. The way remaking things often means doing something under the same rubric, um, saying it that way. And I'm not claiming that I'm answering Cortazar, and I'm not claiming I'm answering Pound, although you know that is an, an issue. Um, but I'm just claiming to be doing 
parallel work. But so there's a, there's a quotidianness in current work and also a turn to the visual text, which I can't go into um, here, but it, there's evidence on the web because it's the best place to publish that since some of it is in color, which is hell to pay when you want to publish a book, believe me. Nobody wants to pay for it precisely. So on that, on that note, should we? On that note, we need to thank you. I presume, unless there is another pressing question, we are all going to go home and think through all this. Thank you, thank you so much. It's been a deeply enriching day. Come back. <laughs>